Okay, today we're going to actually focus on two different things. We're going to start with just looking at the issue of, we'll continue with structural framing, but we'll look at how we could actually take all those structural framing elements, actually pull them into an analysis program, and do a little computation on them based on the loads we're putting on those elements, and even make changes in the analysis program that we want to bring back into our Revit model. So that's what we're doing for the first part of class. Second part of class, what I really want to do is just turn it over to you, give you some time to work with your teammates on the project and kind of just like, you know, work through it. I know it's really hard to get together and find time outside of class. So let me start with just some general questions or answers to questions about the project, sort of floating around in general as people have been working on it. A um, couple different things. I think most of you know that the due date got postponed from this Friday. Okay, we went ahead and pushed that back till next Monday night at midnight. Okay, to give everyone a little bit more time to work on it. Don't reset your expectations in terms of trying to accomplish that much more. Kind of stay with what you have in mind, but give yourself a little time to do it because there's a lot of overhead in trying to get these work sets going and work with phases and the design options and. It's like we're pulling you in five different directions at once. So your simple little model is in one point in time with one option with all those things. All of a sudden now became multi-layered and complex. And just keeping track of the views and the visibility graphics to always have the right things show up in the views can be work. And it takes some time to do all that right. So try to go ahead and give yourself some time. Allow yourself to time to do that. Um, we will have a lot of office hours available um, this evening. Uh, what Spandana is going to be in here from 7 to 10. I'll be here from 5 to like 9. We have that funny hole right at 6 o'clock that we have to kind of move out of the room because of the MATLAB class. But we'll try to work around that. Um, check out in coursework online. Pedro has hours tomorrow. Everyone has hours just throughout the week and throughout the weekend. So take advantage of that. We'll also give you some more time in class on Thursday to work on it because yeah, it just takes a while to get all the coordination and all that kind of ready. Okay, in terms of approaching it, I've been posting little tips about just, you know, how to think about the scope of what you're doing, and let me just kind of give you a couple more in there. It's really, as you're going through and doing something like this, which is really a big conceptual design problem along the way, there's so much to do in terms of solving the big design issues that there's a lot of little issues you just have to sort of let go of along the way. So as you're going through and you're trying to figure out the shape of the building and what the auditorium might even look like and how the different pieces fit together in a very high level way. Along the way, if your railings don't exactly connect to your staircase just right, that's okay. Okay, there's gonna be a lot of little things along the way that you just don't have the time in one week to go through and solve all of those little problems. One of the problems with modeling things in 3D like this is that there's sort of this nagging desire to try and get everything to look just perfect in every 3D view. And when we're doing this conceptual design, you're really necessarily making some very big, broad brush, brush sort of uh, you know, statements about what it is you have in mind. Littler things would you get picked up on the next round or the next round. You know, at this level, what the client really is they want to just sort of see the overall building and say, ah, that's kind of what I have in mind. That looks good. Yes. Keep on going. That they do the and then you are filling it out in more and more detail. But as you go, you know, don't worry. Let your, give yourself a little bit of freedom and don't just labor over in one specific room. I can't quite get the curtain wall to do exactly what I want because you'll spend so much time on that one room, you'll miss the other like 80% of it. Okay, so definitely think about this as a sort of a very top down, and you can love a few areas in a little more detail, but don't try to do everything. Otherwise, you'll, you'll, just, you'll definitely run out of time. There's six months worth of work here, not two weeks. Okay, um, other things in general. For a phase two, really at some level, that's, that's more of a, almost like a bookkeeping problem than it is a design problem in that you're just trying to figure out rooms and spaces and allocating into different departments. And as long as you're working with the schedules and the tables, you try and see that overall you've got things allocated about to the right level, you'll do okay there. No one's expecting huge, great, innovative design in phase two. They've given you a shell of the building. You can do some things to it, but it's pretty limited about what you can do within that shell. So really focus your big design idea in phase three. Okay, that's really where you have your chance to make your architectural statement. Because okay, so phase two, yeah, divide it up, kind of have some ideas about what's going on there. But really phase three is where that's where you have the swoopy doopy, whatever it is that you have in mind that you really want to illustrate. So again, just to kind of make things a little bit easier for yourself. There was a real funny, but just very specific question about how to handle 
hallways and bathrooms and shared spaces because they're not really built into the budget. The budget really was sort of built not really allowing for the shared spaces. And that's kind of a very typical thing. So I'd sent out an email last night suggesting that you could almost really just, you know, dock every department by the same percentage. If you figure out that in building view after you sort of lay it out that, oh, 15% of the building is lost to hallways and bathrooms and stairways, you can then just go ahead and dock every department 15%. Okay, th that's sort of a fair way to do it in terms of thinking about it. So, yeah, you don't have to, yeah, <laughs> but it, it's not really fair to charge the hallway space to a department. Maybe it is. The bathrooms, the stairways, just because it happens to be enclosed by a bunch of that department's rooms. Okay, so, yeah, typically we share those things as more of an overhead item. Okay, any general questions about assignment four? Okay, because we'll give you some time. We'll definitely come around and answer a lot of specific questions. Okay, but, okay. Beautiful. Most everyone's paired up in a team or they're, they're working with someone they got all set up that way. Okay, beauty. Let's go ahead. We will push that aside for right now, jump into structural framing stuff, and then we'll uh, return to that stuff at the end of class. Okay, so in terms of structural framing, where we had started last time was we were showing you how to put in themes and columns and just start to model the structural framing elements. And we'd like to continue with that thread. We're going to start by just looking at a workflow of how you can use Revit architecture and structure together with analysis software. And we'll illustrate that today, where we start with Revit architecture and structure, and we start by just modeling the structural framing. So we put in the columns and the beams and the beam systems, things like that. Then in Revit structure, what we do is we actually set up some boundary conditions and some of the structural analysis constraints, add some loads get this model ready for analysis. So we go through and we put on the structural information. Now, Revit structure and Revit architecture are just alike in so many ways, but some of the tools for actually putting in the loads and the boundary conditions are only available in Revit structure. So you can share the files very easily. I can give you my architecture file. You can open it in the structure. You can do things, and when you give me back your structure file, I'll open it in architecture. The only difference is going to be that in architecture, I can't change your boundary conditions and loads. Okay, it's just sort of, oh, all the versions of Revit have some tools that are unique to that version, and to edit those aspects of the model, you have to be look at working in that version. Fine, there's actually a similar thing that goes on when we take our model and we give it to the MEP software people. Um, there are tools in the mechanical electrical plumbing package which are all about designing HVAC systems, and they're only available in that tool, but we store it all in the same model. Okay, so we are going to work software, the Revit software, to go through and set up the model, get it ready. And then we're actually going to hand it off to the analysis. Now today we're going to look at E-tabs, just because a lot of folks in the structural classes here use E-tabs to do their analysis. Um, but there are really several different packages available. There's like, mm, like 20 different packages that Revit models will interface with. And the way it works is, if you load up that software, they almost always have some little connection between Revit and the analysis software. And if we go through and load that up, um, we basically have the ability to just pull the Revit model and all the elements defined there into the software, where we can then analyze it, make any changes, revise any members as necessary. But the important part is that we, at the end of that process, we've made some changes in the analysis software. We'd like to get that back into Revit so that we really have an ear to workflow. So it's not one way and it's not sequential, but by doing it this way, I can do some architecture, hand it over to you. You can do some analysis and size things up. And as you keep on working and I keep on working, your changes will come back and update my model. And I can make changes to my model and pass them back to you. So no one's losing any work. Okay? So that's the idea of what we're trying to do here. To illustrate that, we're just going to go into Revit structure. And I'm going to set up a real simple little frame to start with. And let me make this as a general suggestion whenever we're looking at doing the analysis software. Just understanding how your model is going into the analysis software, what the analysis software is doing, is itself a big old task. So rather than starting with your masterpiece of five stories of glass and steel and all the complex architecture that's there, start with a real simple little test case, just something that is so simple that when you get it over to the analysis software and you do use the analysis tools, You'll understand the results and be able to intuitively say, hey, that makes sense, or oops, no, I got something wrong going on here. Okay, so start with something that's really simple 
And after you sort of get the mechanics worked out of how that flow and that interchange is going to work, then bring your model in. But always start with these little unit cases because you want to basically make sure that you have something that has a predictable result and a very you know, that you can intuitively verify. Okay. So rather than starting with my big unit assignment for a building, I'm going to actually go through and just start with something very small. Like I'm going to build a real frame out of some columns <coughs> and a beam, and to start with that. So to get going, what I'm going to do is come on in. I'm going to open Revit Structure. If you'd like to follow along today, please do. Revit Structure is out there on all your screens. 2010, you'll find it under the Start menu. If you'd prefer not to follow along and just actually quietly work along with your teammate on assignment four, go ahead and do that too. I'm not, I'm not going to be offended if you're busily tooling away because I realize time is very precious. Okay, so as we do these things, realize that this part, the part of doing structural analysis, this isn't part of the assignment. You don't have to go through and do this as part of this assignment. I'm just showing it now because I'm getting ready for the next assignment on downstream. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up an existing file. It's kind of just a lean file, as in there's just very few components loaded into it. But you can just open a new project file if you want. We're in Revit structure right now. Revit structure looks so, so similar to Revit architecture. The big difference you might notice is that up here at the far left of the home ribbon, beam, wall, column, floor, truss brace, structural elements are featured there. And all those things like doors and windows, which were featured in the architectural tool, they kind of got relegated to the architect tab. Okay, doors and windows and some other things in there. But other things, collaborate with work sets, that looks just the same. Manage with your design options, it's just the same place. The modify with the align, the trim, the, all the favorite tools, the annotations, all these things are just the same. So it should be fairly familiar popping back and forth between these different tools. Okay, because really the, the core software is about, you know, 95% the same. Okay, we're going to go to, let me go up to level two. And I am going to place a couple columns. I'm also going to go ahead and place a little beam in there. In fact, oh, maybe I'll even start with this. I'll put a grid line down since that's what I like to start with. I'll just put a grid line down. That'll be grid line one. Let me change that to grid line one. Beautiful. And when I come on in and I go through and I try to place a few columns down, I'll say column, I'll say structural column. I'll just put some steel columns in now for this simple little thing. It's, I have the choice of either going down to level one or I can go up to another level. I'm going to go down from level two to level one. It's kind of just a different way of thinking about it. So I'm going to put a column right on here. I'll come on over there. I'll put a column just sort of over in here. Okay, nothing too special just yet. Take a look at that in 3D. There we are. Let me even show these as wireframes so you get a better sense of the columns. Notice as I go through and I put in the elements, I have the 3D representation, the way I'm used to looking at things, but I also have that blue line. That's the an analytical line. So at some level for doing analysis, all these different members get reduced to single line representations. Okay? And how those lines interconnect is really, you know, it's, it's going to determine whether or not they're considered to be physically connected for the analysis. Okay, so I've got a blue line in there. I place some columns. Come back on over here. So I started by creating a grid system. Then I placed some columns using the structural column tool. Again, here I went down as opposed to up, but that's not a big difference. You can go either way. And finally, I'm going to use the beam tool. I'm going to place a beam between those things. So to place the beam, let me go back over to Revit structure. I'll zoom on out, kind of get myself reoriented here. The beam tool is right over here. And I can choose a beam size. Oh, I'll just kind of stick with these 12 by 26s for now. We'll, again, take a look at whether we think those sizes are adequate in just a bit. I have the issue of what plane I'm going to put them on. What I'm actually going to do is turn on 3D <coughs> snapping, because 3D snapping will let me snap them in this view. What if we don't have 3D? Um, where are you? Let's take a look. Oh, for you, it's down at the bottom. Oh. It just got moved. 
And I wish I knew how to get the options bar back up to the top on that machine, because once it's down there, I have a hard time dragging it around. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to snap over here. I'm going to snap to the top of this one. Notice when I snap, if I actually get right on it, it'll give me a little indication that purple highlight shows up. My beam is in there. Notice the beam has an orange analytical line. Now, just to be absolutely certain that you got it connected, try orbiting around a little bit. Just make sure that they really did connect. If they don't quite connect, you might have actually gotten that beam down on the floor, or it might be connecting to something in the distance. So if you give yourself a little orbit, you'll sort of verify that it really is interconnected, and that's what I want to have happen. Okay, so see if we can get those simple frame, that simple frame put together. So far, so good. Okay, let me zoom on out. I'm going to go through, and now that I've put a beam in there in my simple little frame, I'm going to put a foundation under it. I'd like to actually have some sort of foundation so that you know, I can't just have that steel column coming down to the ground, all the weight that's on it. Well, actually, it'll create a little local failure in the ground. It'll sort of the ground will go and smoosh out the sides, something like that, because you have too much weight there, you'll exceed the bearing capacity. So what I need to do is actually put a, some sort of a pad underneath there that'll distribute the weight coming down in that column to a broader area, less than the bearing capacity of the soil. So I can come on back over here, and in Revit, you'll find there's actually different column types, there are foundation types. There's an isolated type, a wall type, and a slab type. I'm going to go for the isolated foundation. That's sort of what I typically put. Oh, well, let's go take a look. OK, let me go out to structural. I'll say foundations. I'll make this footing rectangular, the one I want to work with. OK, you may not have had that. I mean, I leaned out this file before we got started, so I might have made it a little too lean. Okay, I'm going to connect it right into the bottom there. Zoom on out. And I'll do the same thing over here. Right in there. See if I can snap to that. Okay, again, it's always useful to do a little bit of orbiting. Just make sure things are really connected the way you think they are. Zoom out. Zoom out. And orbiting is really just about confirming visually that things seem to be connected. Beautiful. Let me zoom to fit. OK, so I have what looks like my little model. I could have created this model in Revit architecture or structure. So far, I haven't done anything special in structure. I've just done everything that you can do on either side. OK, what we were going to do now is actually kind of start adding a little bit of structural information to it. And to do that, what we're going to do is Start by putting boundary conditions on this. Now, we know in our mind that that footing that's down there is where this thing's going to touch the Earth, and that footing shouldn't move around relative to the Earth. Okay? But we need to tell analytically that that's also what's going to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to lock, using some boundary conditions, the bottom of those columns so that they don't move around. If we don't lock the conditions, we put a lot of loads on it, and we start to say and analyze it, the whole structure will just move. It'll f just drop in space. OK, so we need to put something in there that's going to be locked into place. Let me come on over. I'll get to the bottom of that column. And where I'm going to find that is actually under the Analyze tab. Is that one over there, Cody? Maybe not. Just a chair. OK. I have boundary conditions as one of my choices. I can put a point boundary condition, a line boundary condition that I put under a wall, like a strip footing, an area boundary condition that I would put under a slab. OK, but I'm just going to go for a point. And I'm actually going to pull that in right at that point and just lock that point into place. I'm going to do the same thing over here. Come right on down there, and I'll just lock it in there. Let's take a look at that. Boundary conditions have properties you know, from your structural analysis. You might recognize some of these end conditions. If I say instance properties, we can make them fixed. We can make them pinned. We can make them rollers. 
Okay, and that all has to do with how many degrees of freedom we're locking up. Fixed being, we're locking it in three directions. Pinned in one, no, what is it? Pinned, I can move two ways. No, pinned is locked in two directions, but it still rotates. What is it? Roller is just a single, and I can slide across it. Oh, it's bringing back memories of those of days so many years ago in terms of trying to explain them. But I'm going to leave them fixed for now. Okay, which some of you might recognize as creating an indeterminate structure. Okay, but that's okay because finite element analysis software takes care of all that. So let me zoom on out. So I've set some boundary conditions. You need some boundary conditions. After you set the boundary, we are ready to actually talk about the just the property of how those members connect to each other. Because we've got these steel columns and we have these steel beams coming together, and there's a lot of ways those can connect together. We can have that be just sort of a pinned connection where it still sort of rotates. The beam can rotate relative to the column. We could have it be a rigid moment frame connection where any sort of rotation is actually resisted by the columns too. So you have like a rigid frame as opposed to just a frame where everything's pinned into place. And how you set that up is, we'll come on over here. I can take a look at that beam. And it has some instance properties too. Okay, that has start and end offsets. That's if we actually want to raise or lower the beam just relative to the column top. We'll leave that alone for right now. They have, oh, the beam material. Again, we'll leave that alone. Right in here is what I want to draw your attention to. It's the moment connection at the start and the end. And if we don't want there to be any sort of moment connection, we'll leave it as none. That really makes just a fixed or uh, a pinned connection. That'll let it rotate. It won't transfer the moments across that. Okay. What I'm actually going to go through and do is make it a moment frame. That'll make it a big, rigid frame that's going to resist not only the gravity loads, but also the horizontal loads. And that whole frame will work together that way. Okay. So I can change those things together. Way down at the end here, we also have, oh, the issue of release conditions. And I'm not very good about explaining this. So let me see if I can like uh, defer to some ex explanation the way they put it in there. OK. If it's a pin, which I they are. If it's fixed, then moments aren't released. Moments will be transferred across that connection. So it's really like what you want for a moment frame. You want them to be fixed so that the moments are transferred. There's also bending moment, which will release m, y, and m, z in the in y and z direction, but it'll keep things in x. Okay, so there's this is basically it's yeah in this area you're determining what sort of loads are transferred across the joint. Okay, so if you have a moment frame, we should actually make those fixed. As opposed to pin connections, which won't which won't transfer the moments across. I'll say OK to those things. OK. Not much looks like it changed over there, but we are now ready. We have our model sort of specified. We've got some boundary conditions. We've specified a little bit about how those beams and the columns interact with each other. We are ready to put some loads on this thing. OK. Loads. Let's talk about loads. OK. Loads. Most of you have to stand for your structure engineering courses. We have point loads, which are applied at a single point. A line load, which would be applied along a sort of just linear surface like a beam. Or area loads, which would be applied to, let's say, a whole floor plate. OK. So like a certain number of pounds or kips, a certain number of pounds or kips per lineal foot, and then per square foot for area loads. OK. Then we also go ahead and we can assign loads specific types of loadings and give them all a magnitude. Because we actually think about loads as existing in different categories, and that's important when we go through and, oh, what is it? We uh, try to think about just really uh, what, how they're analyzed. Let me kind of demonstrate what I mean. OK. Oh, let's start with just the issue of putting the loads on there. I could put a point load on there, or I can host a load. I'm actually going to put a load along that line. And the question is going to be, do I want to sketch it? Okay, at which point I can draw it like this, and I choose a placement plane. And then I can sort of go from the end of this at level two and bring it all the way over here to that end. Okay, and that'll work. That's effective. It'll put it on there. But I've really just sketched it there. 
it isn't necessarily hooked to the beam. So if the beam moves, the loan won't necessarily move with it. Okay. So even better with that than that, and what I encourage you to use whenever you can, is hosted loads. Hosted loads actually are, I'm going to pick the beam and say, here's the load on that beam, and then it'll always be associated with that beam. So if the host moves, the load moves with it. So I can just choose the whole beam. Okay. And it'll put it automatically across the entire length. Now, host loads, good when you have an entire sort of put it up across the length. You might have to put a smaller load in one section than other sections. Yeah, then just go ahead and sketch them. Yeah, I'm just trying to save you time. But if you you can really customize it, be whatever you want. Now, in terms of what that load is, it has some instance properties. So let's take a look at that. The load itself has sort of what load case it belongs to. And you'll see there's dead loads, live loads, wind loads, snow loads. What are LR? So again, reduced live loads. Excellent. Accidental loads. Okay, temporary, seismic, and some new cases that are yet to be defined. Okay, so you can define different cases. I'm going to make this just be, oh, also made it be a live load for right now. Okay, it has a magnitude in there. Right now it is minus one kip per feet, so essentially 1,000 pounds per foot pointing down. If I want to make that a little bit less, I can say, oh, let us make that 0 0.5. Okay, that's 500 pounds per foot. Kips are 1,000 pounds. Okay, you could also go through and sort of not only have a floor, uh, load go strictly down, you could go ahead and apply it at a sideways angle or any angle that sort of makes sense. You could resolve that into X, Y, Z if you have loadings coming in at funny angles. So that's my load right there. That's my live load. Let me also go ahead and put some dead load on that thing too. And I will go through, I'll say loads again. I'll put a hosted load on it. Okay, and for this one, let me take a look at its properties. I'll leave this in the dead load case, and I'll say that's actually less. It's like 100 pounds per foot. Oops, did I get the right one? Actually, I think I needed to select that one before I did that. I just sort of created the default for the next one. Okay, so you can see my two different loads kind of hanging around in there. The orange load being the live load, the purple load being the uh, dead load. Okay, now let's talk about load cases. These are the ones that have been defined, right, so far. Dead load, live load. You can set up your own cases. In general, those first eight are the ones that most people use in their structural analysis. Dead loads, live loads, wind loads. But you can create, up, create some more cases. That's one that I actually added last time, so let me delete that out. Okay. We can also put together load combinations, so let's talk about that. You can rate different combinations of loads, and combinations of loads are handy in that there, there are several types of analysis where you have to actually sort of factor together different loads with different weighting factors to allow for worst cases. So for example, one combination that we use is 1.2 times the dead load plus 1.6 times the live load. And you can set up a formula that relates that together into a combination load case Okay, that we might want to analyze. Oh, I forget what that one does exactly. But if I want to change that, I can sort of change the formulas down here. Let me show you how you would add a new one. I could say, oh, this is going to be combo three. Does anyone have any like good examples of uh, like a combination load case, some sort of factors? If not, I'll just throw another one in there. I'll, I'll just make them up as we go. Of course, you just have these off the top of your head, right? So three times the dead load plus, oh, I'll say one times the live load plus, I'll say, oh, 0.5 times the seismic loads or something like that. But really, based upon your, your code requirements and your plan checking requirements, they'll specify the different load cases that you have to check. And usually what we're doing is, in most cases, we check all these different loading cases, and we're really looking for the worst case, or what really the governing case is what I should, what I should describe it, the case that's really going to ultimately determine how big your beams have to be, how big your columns have to be. 
Okay, and it sort of varies a little bit. I'm going to say okay. I've got my load case three there. Beautiful. Okay, so far so good. We are hanging out. We got our beam. It's got loads. It's got boundary conditions. The beam understands how it's relating to the columns. I think we're in pretty good shape. Okay, there's our combinations. We can add, delete, or rename them, and we create these formulas to relate them together. We are now ready to take this over and do some analysis on this thing. So let us do it as follows. What we're going to do is go to the Add-ins tab, and we under the Add-ins tab, we're going to find some tools for linking this model to eTabs. And again, it's showing up here because I've loaded eTabs in the linking software. Now, if you would like to work with eTabs on your own computer at home or on your laptop, we have it available in the department site license for it. So if you're interested, just send me some email, and I'll go ahead and send you the instructions for that. Actually, I'll probably just post them to the course site, too. But um, you can download the software. The only restriction for using the software is that you have to be on the virtual private network, or you have to be on the network, because it has to check in against our license server. Okay, So whenever you want to use it, you just have to be on the network. But other than that, it's available to use. And if you want to install the connector between Revit and eTabs, it's also available for you can Okay, so, so you can get your machine set up just the way these are if you want. There's also some other analysis tools. So if you have a specific tool you're trying to get your Revit model to talk to, just go ahead and send me a message, and we'll you know, think about the best way to get those two things talking. We'll go to Add-ins, which is where these additional tools live. And under External Tools, you'll see that we can export to create a new eTab model or export to update a model. We could also import to create or update a model. So we can, the first time out, create a new eTabs model. Later on in the process, several iterations through, I may want to just be updating the eTabs. Because I've already made some changes in the analysis. I don't want to kind of keep on creating everything new. Okay. So I can send things over to eTabs either as a full brand new model or as an update that will be resolved against the model over there. When I bring it back in from eTabs, I can create a brand new model. I just don't even care about my Revit model. I only want to sort of click at whatever was in eTabs. Or I can update the model and just pull the changes. Either way. But we are going to go through and start with the simplest one, exporting and creating a new eTabs model. I'll say OK to that. Say start to continue. And what it's going to do is it's going to pad around in my Revit model and try and figure out what's of interest and what isn't of interest. OK. It'll say OK there. It says, you have one grid line that I like. And you have three pieces that are making a frame that I like. And you have two footings that I like. You have two different line loads and three different load combinations that have been defined. So it went through and found what were interesting. Notice that it won't find things like just partition walls, or windows, or doors, or anything, furniture. It won't find any of those things. It's only going to find things that are structurally active. Okay, So we can say, yes, I like those things. Send those on over. We're going to go through and give it a name. Save it somewhere on your disk. I'm going to say it's class session 2A. It's an eTabs Revit structure exchange file, an EXR file. Save that away. And that was it. Pretty uninteresting or unexciting, but let's go ahead and like make it a little more exciting. If I come back out here and I go to Documents, you'll see, oh, we'll find that thing. It's really just a small little file. There's not much to it. There's 2A. 5K. So not much to it. It's a very small little file. But there's just enough information in there to tell eTabs what to do. So I'm going to open eTabs and take a look at the there, over there. Here comes eTabs. How many of you are familiar with eTabs? Have you used eTabs in another class? Yay. <laughs> Get me out of trouble when I go down to the rabbit hole here. No, I, won't, I won't be in my cell. Oh, come on. <laughs> Don't tell me that. We, we have to get through this together. OK. Import. I'm going to import a Revit structure EXR file. I'll just use the default EDD. Mm 
Let me go ahead and choose the file name now. I can go ahead and choose my inch, uh, like my kip inches versus kip feet. I can choose my dimension system that I want to work with. I'll just keep it as kip inches. And whoa, let's see what's happened in here. I have a grid line, grid line one. I have some different column elements. I have the beam element there. I think I have a lot of what I want to be seeing here. Okay, that's good. So I don't have to go through and redefine those things. Let me start by just showing you some of the stuff that we can see. Oh, in eTabs, and again, I'm no pro at eTabs, there's this choice over here where I can set the building view options. And in that, I can say, oh, show me the line sections. And what that'll do is it'll actually just show me the members' names and sizes. So I can go ahead and show you that. You'll see it's a 12 by 26, and it's a 10 by 49 for the columns. And the reason it's those things is, if I go back over to Revit Structure, and I come over here, you'll see those were the types. That's the 12 by 26, and that's the 10 by 49. So it's picking up all the elements. ETABS is reading those, and it's up, pulling up all the right information so it can do the right analysis based on the structural properties there. Okay, let me pop back in again. Back over to ETABS, here we are. Okay, another thing we can do is we can say, show me the loads. And oh, I always have to figure out where this is going to be. Show the loads on the frame and line. I can choose which load case. I can show the dead loads. Okay, and that's the dead load. I can also go ahead and say, show me the live loads. These are the ones that came from Revit. Look a little bit different. Actually, it's rescaling, so you can't really see the difference. Let me turn off the members. Okay. But I got something it has down here. It has these little like fixed connections down there. I think it's actually in pretty good shape. Another thing you can do is say, show me the end releases. Okay. I'm not seeing any right now. That's because this is actually a rigid frame right now. There aren't any end releases. And that's a good thing. I just like to do that to verify that, yes, everything is all locked together. If there's releases, then it's going to let some sort of forces, whether it's moments or just something, pass through the joint. This is actually a rigid frame now. OK, so I've got some uh, structural elements here. What I need to do now is say, let's take a look and analyze this. So I'll say, run the analysis. It'll do a little work. Okay, it has locked the structure right now, locked the model, and now we can go ahead and say, let's go through and, oh, let me show some member diagrams. I wanted to do you. Oh, but not for dead load static. I wanted to do it for like the live load choose the right loading case. There we go. And we're starting to see now there is a kind of a typical diagram. This is one where we actually have moment being resisted at the ends. Okay, so we have positive moment at the ends and it sort of dips on down to the maximum moment which is down there in the center of the beam. So that's kind of a typical sort of shear and bending or bending moment diagram for a kind of a rigid frame. We can go ahead and take a look at some other things if we wanted to instead. We can take a look at the shear forces. I'm very bad about sort of figuring out the directions. Hang on, not that one. Let me go the other way. Kay. That looks like a shear diagram the way I'm used to seeing them on a beam. And if I want to, I can even go through and show, oh, the reactions. So I can say, show the reactions based upon the live load. Okay, And I'll actually sort of show you, oh, just exactly what it is, 6.82. Probably kips kind of coming up on either side. Okay, so we're doing pretty good. Let me come back here again and I'll say, oh, show the uh, those again. And then what I want to do is, if I can get this to work, right click on that. Yes, I can right click on that. And you can actually see that for these different sort of loading conditions, 
I can actually get sort of shear and bending moment diagrams really for the beam. And you can see right now they're actually set to the show the maximum. But within E-tabs, I can actually just sort of scroll on over. And I can figure out exactly what the load is that's coming down, what the shear is that's due to that load, as well as kind of what the deflection is due to that load. Or I should be able to come on down and using my combo cases, okay, Again, the combo cases being a certain amount of dead load plus a certain amount of live load plus a certain amount of seismic, whatever I've set up the formulas between those, it's just recomputing the values based on those. Since my live and my dead loads were actually the same across the entire beam, the shapes don't look very different, but the maximums actually change a little bit. So you can choose to look at individual cases or you can choose to look at the combo cases, really whatever makes the most sense for what you're doing. Okay, so the idea is with this information, with these maximum moments, with these maximum shears, you can now, in the tool, go through and do some analysis to choose the right member size. Okay, I'm not going to show you how to do that in ETABS because that's a whole other thing in terms of what to do. And whether or not you trust ETABS automated algorithm or whether you want to do that by hand with your steel manual, there's a lot of sort of pluses and minuses to different approaches. But in some of the tools, there actually are things that'll say, let me verify the size of your member against these loads, and I'll tell you whether or not something needs to be adjusted. Okay, some people don't like to do it that way because they like to do it by hand, but you can do it either way. In any case, what happens at the end of all this is you're going to choose some new members. And let me unlock the model, and I will say that, okay, We've gone through, we've computed some numbers, and based on this, I want to choose a different size for this thing. So what I can do is, I'm thinking of assigning a frame section. So what I'm going to do is just go through and put in something very, very big so you can see the difference. I'm going to decide, oh, that really needs to be a very big one. It doesn't need to be a big one, but that's going to be very much more is visible to you when we bring it on back. Let me say OK. Oh, looks like I had that thing selected over there, too, the column also. That, that probably doesn't need to be that much. I'll assign a frame section to that, and that can be, oh, it was 10 by 49. Let me make it 12 by 96. Again, this is all sort of nonsensible in terms of the actual structural analysis, but it'll just demonstrate the point. Okay, so I'm in an ETABS, I did my analysis, I did my computations, I went through and I resized the members in ETABS based on what I decided would be appropriate members for this structure. Okay, and at the end of all that, what I can do is basically say, actually, let me do a save. No harm in doing a save. Looks like it's saved already. OK, that's good. Let me go through and do an export. And I'm going to export a structure exchange file. Let's say we're going to update an existing RIT model. I'll come over here. I'll say this is class 2B, because it's sort of the second stage in the process. Save that away. Let me come on back over to Revit. Okay, Revit still has all these old members. It has the 12 by 26, things like that. What I need to do over here is I will just go through and let me import to update an existing Revit structure model. I'll go out there and grab 2B, where I put it, there it is. Say OK. Okay, I actually know that I've only changed a few things, so I'm going to turn off some things just to make it a little bit quicker. Although, this still takes so, so long. I didn't really change any of the loads. I really just changed some of the frame elements. So let me say okay to that. Start. And now it begins the big process, and it's going to count up to around 2,500. There's a lot of things that it's going to go through and check. So. Now is a perfect time to like take a few questions as we're waiting for that stuff because you don't want to hear me sing and dance. And if you don't have any questions, how about this? 
Why don't you jump up and we'll take this as our break a little bit early, but stand up, stretch. When you come on back in just a few minutes, hopefully this thing will be have been imported and I'll show you how to do a slightly more complicated frame and then we'll turn you loose uh, in terms of your assignment. Okay. What has happened while you were away is the import has finished. It has gone through and found some different things. It's found like three different frames that need updating. What I'm going to do now is say OK, and what it'll do is pull those things in and actually change my Revit model based on what it's found that got changed over in eTabs. So I'll say OK. I'll ignore the warning for now. But what you'll notice that happens more quickly than anything is that that size got changed. This thing is gigantic right now because it actually pulled in this giant 30 inch beam instead. Notice over here also there's a 12 by 96 over there and there is a 10 by 49 over there. So the sizes have changed. The loads have stayed the same. The members have changed, uh, sizes have changed. The end connections are still the same. We really have integrity of our model. We just have uh, different the element sizes loaded into it based on what was chosen over there. Okay, so that actually really the idea behind the workflow. Now I can go through and given this information, I can start adapting my model. I might need to go through and change the ceiling height or change the location of where the HVAC equipment is going to run because that beam is so much bigger than I had planned. I can do some actually interference checking, and we'll show you that a little bit later in the course too, to identify is that thing clash. But the idea is that based on the structural information, we now have a little bit more to continue with our architectural design. Okay, let me do this. Let me go ahead and I'm going to just sort of generalize this a little bit and show you simple frames are kind of a nice thing, but we're going to start getting to something that's a little bit more complicated. And let me start by just, oh, I'll grab this simple one line of a structure. I can copy it and I'll move it over and we'll create something which is really much more like a bent of a building. Okay, I've just copied to get those columns and to get the uh, foundation pieces over there. I still need to do with things that I had done before in the sim simple structure. I'll go through and put some boundary conditions underneath these. I'll just lock the bottoms of those columns so those aren't moving. Oh, then I need to go through and put some more beams in. Let me, oh, I'll do 3D snapping so I can go from the top of this one over here. I'll do 3D snapping to go top of this one to that one and 3D snapping to the top of this one to this one. Okay, So I've just created a little uh, kind of 3D frame there. Again, you might want to orbit that around a little bit just to make sure. Maybe even kind of go through and I'll shade those. They're easier to see. Okay, As we're going through and doing steel structures, one thing, yeah Cody? Can you 3D snap to like the middle of the beam? That's a good question. Let's try it. I know I can get to that one. Now it looks like it only is the endpoints. Okay. It looks like only the endpoints. Okay. As we're going through and doing steel structures, a very common thing happens, and it has to do with the steel construction. Of you think about the beam heights, and there's actually a little adjustment we typically make. Here's what the story is. Okay, in a concrete structure, often the concrete beam. And they together into sort of a single element. So concrete beams are often at the same height as the floor level. With steel beams, what tends to always offset them just a little bit. We kind of just pull them down just a hair because what we want to have happen is we want the beams to basically run underneath the floor decking and then the floor to be on top of those beams. Okay. So what I'm going to do is just a little bit different. I'm going to grab all those beams I'll take a look at their instance properties because I'm going to go through and put a little floor deck on top of this, but I want to allow just a little bit of room for that deck. Oh, let me go and do this. I'll change them all to be moment frames. The new ones didn't have that set by default. In fact, even down in here, let me change those to be fixed also. But what I want to do is this start and end level offset. 
I actually want to drop those beams down just a little bit. Okay, so what I'm going to do is actually drop them minus three inches to allow just a little bit of room for the floor to be on top of them. Okay, and it's not a huge difference. If you zoom on in there, you can see the difference. It's just dropped a little. Okay, but it's just enough for what we want to do. Let me zoom on out again. Okay, before I put a big old floor across this entire span, it is quite common that instead of just putting the floor across here, I'll put some intermediate beams or some joists in there. They're going to also uh, help support the floor. That's a beam system, so I can choose the beam system tool. I can, what I'll do is actually pick the supports. The reason I like to pick the supports is then if I actually pick the height, if I pick the beams, okay, what is it? You know, it's going to sort of keep everything associated with those beams. So in <laughs> case the beams move, things will move with it. Here we are. Notice that it's also dropping things down that same three inches. I think. Let's go ahead and say finish the beam system. Actually, I take that back. No, nope, they're not automatically dropped. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do just a little bit of adjustment to that beam system. I'll choose the beam system. There we go. There's the beam system. Let's take a look at its properties. It has that same issue of being able to drop it, the three inches. Then I also have the spacing issue. Right now everything's spaced out at six feet. Let me go ahead and say, oh, you know, these are only going to be about three feet. Okay, and now we're looking good. Okay, so I've gone through and I've created the beams and I've created a beam system to span between. Final thing I want to do here in terms of modeling things in terms of Revit is I'll put a structural floor on this thing. For the structural floor, let me go through and I'll choose the end points or the end beams. Again, picking supports. And I can finish that floor. And you'll see that floor has a top a property. Here it's three inches of lightweight concrete on top of a two-inch metal deck. I actually might need to bring my beams down to five inches to really make that work. <laughs> but you'll see that oh, we're just a little bit below. Actually, let me just go through and just check that to be certain. When all else fails, draw a section. So we can verify our heights. Let me zoom on in. It's not showing me very much detail, so I'm going to turn up the level of detail. There we go. You'll see my beams are actually too high right now. Let me see if I can grab that whole system. What I want to do is again go back over there. It looks like it's three plus two, so what I really need to do is drop those all down to five. So again, let me see if I can get these. Zoom out. I'm trying to get them, but it's not. Let me go to wireframe, see if I can do it that way. There we go. Let me change those. I didn't drop them quiet enough. Let me drop it to minus five inches. You know, think about why it's not letting me do things right now. My computer's just sort of complaining to me. There we go. Now let me go back and take a look in that section again and see. That's looking better. So that deck is actually sitting on top of the beams now, and that's really what I have in mind. 
Beautiful. So go through, and if you build an accurate model, it'll do a better job of doing the analysis. You have to have an accurate model about how things are actually going to be built. Okay. Final thing I want to do is apply some loads to this thing. Let me zoom on out. When I go through and I say I want to put the loads on it, I'm going to try, as opposed to doing a line load, let me do an area load. An area load will let me just go through and choose the edge of the floor, and it'll put it over the entire floor area. So if I now go through and take that, and I'll take a look at its instance properties, I can say, oh, that's minus uh, 200 pounds a square feet. Okay, which is actually a very heavy load, so there must be some heavy equi uh, equipment up there or something like that. Okay. We have our basic model, so we have boundary conditions. We have on all the different supports. That's all like supported with the boundaries. We have our members that are kind of constrained properly at the ends. We have the load on top of it. We're ready to go ahead and analyze this thing. So what I'm going to do is in the same sense, go back to add-ins, external tools. I'm going to create a new eTabs model this time. Say start. Let's see what it comes up with. There should be some more elements this time. <coughs> okay, let's take a look at what it thinks is in there. Two grid lines, 17 framed elements, one floor slab, four footings, an area load, and three combo loads. Looks about like what I expect. Let me say uh, class to C. Then when I come back over to eTabs, I can import that. I'll go ahead and grab class 2C. It's a little unhappy about my floor. Something about in my floor, it thinks that the layer thickness of this concrete cast in place is set to zero, which is upsetting it a little bit. I'm going to go back and check that a little bit later. But I think there's probably something that needs to be changed about that. Say OK. OK, here is my model in eTabs. It has all those different frame elements shown. We can go ahead and I'll turn off those. What else do I want to have happen? There's the grid lines in there. It's pretty much ready to go. Let us go through and do our analysis. I'm applying things. There we go. That's the deformed shape of it right now. And if I go through and I say, oh, let me go through and choose something like this. Oops. I can say, go through and show the forces. And for example, there's the shear and bending moment diagrams, really, for all the different frame members. So you sort of have the big end members, then you have like all the in-between ones that are in there based on that big area load. What I want to do is turn it over to you. So we will adjourn as a class for today, and then uh, just like uh, basically be available to answer questions. So if you want to be working in your groups and take advantage of this time, please do that. If you need to be somewhere else to finish something up and you want to come back later for office hours after 5, that is fine too. Just kind of whatever sort of fits your schedule best. So let us break there for today. And when we come on back next time, we'll go ahead and take a look at a different application, which is going to be how we can go ahead and use these models for building performance analysis for energy modeling. Okay? So let me go ahead and let me stop this thing and I'll come.